Welcome TLC family. I'm Pastor Shauna Jacobs from the Life Church Avenel and this is online Bible study. We are currently in a study called Immersed in Grace. And we've been really trying to be more conscious of the grace of God that surrounds us every single day. When we get more grace conscious than sin conscious, that's when we see a real breakthrough in our life. Um, even when it comes to, you know, fulfilling your calling and living for God, instead of being, you know, having this performance mentality where we're on the hamster wheel, just trying, trying, trying so hard to please God, now, we are rested in His grace and we are walking in His grace. We're empowered by His grace to walk out our salvation, to do and fulfill what He's called us to do. But instead of it being a, a, out of a relationship that's stress and strain and wondering if we're going to please God or is He going to be angry with us, now we're secure in His love. We understand that His love toward us was unconditional. It had no strings attached. You know, we were talking a couple weeks ago about the prodigal son and how the father um, took him back without a thought, restored him to his position, gave him the robe, threw him the feast, and it definitely was not based on his performance. And as Jesus was telling the people this story, he was demonstrating the father's love toward us. For God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus. And Jesus fulfilled all of the law. Jesus fulfilled all the requirements that we were trying to measure up to and couldn't. And gave us his grace, his life, uh, peace with the Father. We got so much as a result of what Jesus did for us. And it was all simply by faith. And so we were talking about just trusting the rescuer, right? That a, an image of faith is like you're, you're on in a built, burning building and the death and destruction is creeping up on you. That's, you know, all this left for you here. But the rescuer has a net spread out underneath and he's ready to catch you, right? And we just need to take that simple step. That's what faith is, just a simple yes towards Jesus and what he's done. And that gives us access to the grace of God and everything that God has provided for us. So it was simply faith. That's how we got saved and that's how we continue in our salvation every single day. And it, it's so good because God did it this way. He set up salvation, this whole system this way so that there'd be no restrictions on people or no one excluded um, who, you know, maybe was not as skilled as another. Um, in Romans 4, 16, it says, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all of the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So why is it simply faith that gives us access to this grace? So it might be sure, a sure thing to all, to all who call in the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? And so God made it this simple for a reason. And religion has tried to corrupt this, right? The apostle Paul we read um, several weeks ago said, that, uh, that there were those who were creeping into the church at Galatia who were trying to pervert the gospel, trying to mix works with grace and putting people back under bondage and saying, well, yes, you got saved by grace, but now you still have to keep the law and you still have to be circumcised and you still have to do this and that and this and that. And Paul was very bold about it. He said, if salvation could come through any other means, then Jesus Christ died in vain. He died for nothing, if that were possible. But it was, it's not possible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so simply believing our rescuer, simply believing Jesus, our savior, that he took care of it all for us. And we just get to, we get in on all of the goodness of God because of his track record and not ours. That gives us access to all of this. Hallelujah. And so Jesus, he simply needed our yes, right? He simply needs our yes. And this is the approach that continues throughout our Christian walk every single day, 
everything that you need is provided through the work of Jesus Christ. And so now as we approach God, we're not begging him, trying to get him to give us something. We're not trying to prove to him that we deserve something, whether it's a blessing or a healing or provision, whatever it might be. No, we're simply approaching him as a child because he loved us so much that he really did it all. Hallelujah. And so today we're going to move forward um, into our fifth lesson, maintained by grace is what I'm calling it, maintained by grace. And so we're going to be starting in Romans 5, 8 today. Romans 5, 8, and I want to continue to develop this idea of, you know, our salvation, walking out our salvation after receiving Jesus by grace. Because again, I feel like that's where, you know, the, the religion has tried to cloud the waters, right? It's become very murky, like, okay, you received Jesus, but now if you don't clean up your act, if you don't do this and that and this and avoid this and that and this, then you could still go to hell or God will still be angry with you or you don't deserve that healing that you need. Um, and so I want to continue to dive into this so that you can see everything that we receive from Jesus, from God the Father is by grace. We can't earn it. And so Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now let's pause there for a second, as many do, and say, God loves the sinner. Absolutely true, right? God loves the sinner. He loved us before we came to him, before we said yes to salvation. He loved us unconditionally. But the Apostle Paul didn't stop there. He's using this to draw a comparison. And so let's keep going. I'll reread that verse and then we'll continue on. So verse 8 again said, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And so I love the phrase, much more. So Paul's saying, okay, God loves the sinner so much that he sent Jesus to die even when we didn't deserve it, we were ungodly, we had nothing to offer in return, right? God loved the sinner. Much more, now that we're justified on this side of the cross, on this side of our yes, to the salvation and everything Jesus provided. He said much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We are saved from wrath. The wrath of God is not poured out on the believer. Hmm. This is good, right? Because so many people get confused when they think about, you know, the return of Christ and they picture, you know, the judgment seat and, you know, God still might be angry with you if you don't do enough good works. You know, if you didn't, um, you know, prove yourself worthy of the name of Jesus while you were on this earth, then there still might be wrath. No, we've been saved from wrath through him. How much more? Does he love us now that we have been grafted into his family? Hallelujah. And so when Paul was talking about the gospel being the power of God unto salvation, he wasn't just talking about the initial born again experience. He loved you and died for you when you were ungodly. How much more does he love you now? that you are born again. And so think about this, right? As parents, and many of you watching, you are parents, you have children, right? And we think about the love that we have for our children. Now, if I can compare that for just a moment to the love I have for my students, right? As a public school teacher, I love kids, right? I, my whole career is really um, based on influencing kids and loving them and just having them understand the goodness of God through me, being a positive role model for them. I love kids. But is it the same kind of relationship that I then have for my children? And those of you who are parents understand, no, it's not. 
Like I love my students, but I can't take them home with me. I can't, you know, dis help them decide on their future and, you know, all of those things that a parent does because they have parents, right? They have a family and that's not my place to step in and do that. So I can be an influence and a positive role model, but I'm not the parent in that relationship. But when it comes to my children, how much more, right? I think about when Isaac was first born, um, and, uh, and he was born on, you know, a rainy night in Canada, um, Smith Falls Hospital, and, you know, they brought him to me after the whole delivery and everything. Um, and I remember looking at him the next morning, we're in the hospital, and thinking, wow, he's mine. I get to like walk out of here and take him home with me and no one's going to stop me or ask for him back because he is my child. And it was just, you know, such a, a, a powerful thought because I'd looked after lots of kids before that babysitting and younger siblings and all of that kind of thing. But this one was mine. How much more? So Paul in Romans 5 verses 8 and 9 is drawing the comparison that yes, God loved you when you were a sinner, enough to still send Jesus to die for you. But how much more, now that you are in the family of God, you've been born again, how much more does he love you? How much more are you saved from wrath through him? Hallelujah. You know, we are God's child. And when he adopted us into his family, not only did, you know, he just say, okay, you know, you're not, you know, of me or from me, but I'll take you into my household. No, he rebirthed us from above. He changed our name, gave us his name, gave us his authority, gave us his provision, made us his beneficiary, right? The Bible says we are heirs of God with Christ. He went all the way. And so now that you've been, you know, reborn into the family of God, we are his child. He's not letting you go. Can you imagine, you know, if someone tried to take your child away from you? I know many of you would fight to the death, right? We would fight to the death because no, that is my child. And God is, it says he earns jealously. I'm getting ahead of myself, but we'll get to those verses in the study in the next. But he yearns jealously. He, because you are his, you belong to God. And that's a powerful thing that, you know, God looks at you and says, they're mine. I don't ever have to let them go. Sin's not an issue anymore. The devil can't steal them from me. They're my child. Wow. That's your position with Father God. Isn't that awesome? Wow. And so let's look. We're going to go and read one more verse now. So we'll go to Romans 5.10. But I want, really want you to get this, that not only are we saved from grace, uh, saved by grace, but we are maintained by grace. Our whole relationship is with God through the grace that he's given us. It's all about what he did for us. He loved you so much more, so much more. And this grace gives you access to all of salvation. As we talked about in our study, all-inclusive package, right? We uh, are healed by grace. We are delivered by grace. We are prospered by grace. And so no salvation benefit is performance based. It's all included in the grace for salvation that Jesus gave us. Hallelujah. And so let's go to Romans 5.10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. There's that phrase again, much more. Yes, God loves the sinner, but how much more does he love you, his child? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we know because of this 
love that God had for us, um, that our faith works by love, right? In Galatians 5, 6, it says this, that faith worketh by love. And so if we understand how much God loves us, then our faith abounds, right? Our faith gets stirred. And then we start to see manifestation of all of the benefits of salvation in our lives. It's not from trying to keep the rules and regulations better. No, it's from looking to the love of God and understanding the position he's given you that that stirs faith. That gives us confidence to step out boldness to step out. Hallelujah. And so we are maintained by this grace. So since religion's been preaching this performance-based relationship with God instead of the true gospel, most people believe that the Lord loved them when they were sinners, but that he gets harder on them once they're saved. All right. And so it's like, let me give you this example. I was reading through um, Reverend Andrew Womack's study on grace, and he gave this illustration that I thought was pretty effective. He said, think about your church, right? And let's say a drunkard comes in off the street, right? He's slurring, he's stumbling, he's really messed up. And so church family sees him, you know, surrounds him with love and grace and says, hey, yeah, you know, sit right here and just let the presence of God minister to you. And God loves you so much. And, you know, we make an effort to reach out to the sinner. Well, imagine now that this person that who walks in drunk has been born again. Maybe you've seen them come to church for several years and all of a sudden they come into church service drunk and messed up. Would you treat them with the same grace and mercy? Or would you now give them the law? Because, well, they're born again, so they should know better, right? They need to get their act together or God's wrath is going to be poured out upon their life and they're going to be destroyed. What about grace and mercy surrounding the believer? And so I think that's really telling of our attitude towards, you know, people's mistakes. We have a different measurement. Well, oh, you're a sinner, so okay, we'll let you slide. You're a Christian, so no, you need to smarten up, right? You need to get things together now. And we start to give the law instead of grace, where we know it's the goodness of God who leads people to repentance. If there's a Christian who needs a turnaround, they need to you know, start making changes in their lifestyle because it's destructive. What is going to help the empower them to do that? Is it going to be the law and condemnation or is, is it going to be the grace and mercy of God? Them understanding just like the prodigal son, hey, you know, maybe you haven't been living right. Maybe you've messed up, but the loving father still has his arms open towards you. He loves you much more. He loves you so much that he's not going to leave you in that state, but he wants to accept you and help you to overcome addiction, whatever it might be, right? That's the stumbling block. Hmm. So maintained by grace. Let's go to Colossians 2.6. Colossians 2.6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. As you have received him, so walk in him in the same way that you came to Jesus and received him by grace, knowing that you were not good enough, that he took your sins on the cross, that he died to give you new life, right? Think about how, when you got saved, how you approached Jesus, you knew, Hey, I can't be good enough. I need Jesus. And so we came to him and we received his grace. As we received him, it says, so walk in him. Just like that, that same attitude that we came to him for salvation initially, we walk out our salvation every day of our lives with that same attitude, knowing that, hey, I couldn't measure up. The grace of God, though, was more than enough for me. And so as I just receive that grace, I just receive the mercy, right? That's when, that's when, that's what pleases God, right? That's what pleases him is simply accepting what Jesus has done by faith. Hallelujah. 
So the same way we came to Jesus is the same way we continue every day. And so now our daily time with God, because of this revelation, includes boldness. Now we understand, hey, we, God and I are good. We, I've got peace with God, right? We're good. We're in a close, intimate relationship. And so God's got my back. He's with me and he's in me. Now we're bold, right? If there's something in our lives that is not measuring up to the will of God in heaven, then we bring that boldly before God. We attack a situation with boldness. Um, we, we know that now we're secure in Him. And there's nothing you could ever do to make Him leave you. You know, the Apostle Paul says, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, you know, famine or storm or peril or, you know, all, he makes this whole giant list, persecutions, all these different situations all these scenarios can any of that separate you from the love of christ he says no nothing can separate you from the love of christ there's nothing that you could ever do to make him leave you he will never leave i know this is this is something that this is a security that we need to work on you know giving our family including our spouse and our children you know, how much would it improve your marriage if you told your spouse, I will never leave you. You're not getting rid of me. You're secure in my love, right? That changes things. That gives them a boldness. It helps them to trust you and understand that no matter what comes up, you're going to work on it. You're going to work through it together and you're going to come out stronger on the other side of it. This is what God is telling you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. There's security in that church. There's a, a boldness in that. You know, we sing the song. Uh, well, it's an old song now. We haven't sang it in ages, but come just as you are, right? Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. And, you know, it's kind of an altar call song, right? And we, we expect, you know, sinners to come to the altar and receive Jesus. Come just as you are. But what about Christians? Come just as you are. Hey, you messed up this week? Come anyways. Hey, you've been struggling with addiction? Come anyways. Come just as you are. Because God loves you much more. Hallelujah. So we're maintained by his grace. Um, condemnation, guys, is a huge problem in Christianity. Um, we let the devil beat us up and make us think that we don't deserve blessings. And, you know, he wants to accommodate that. Oh, you, you see that mistake you made? Yeah, now, ooh, I wouldn't go to church if I were you. You'd be a hypocrite if you did that. Oh, someone saw you make that mistake and then they saw you show up at the Life Church on Sunday? No, no, no. And he tries to beat you over the head and make you feel unworthy. Well, newsflash, we were unworthy. There was nothing we could do to get salvation. And that same position where we say, hey, Lord, I don't deserve it, but you love me anyways, and you gave it to me anyways, and so thank you, I receive that. We continue to walk out our Christianity, our salvation every day with that same attitude. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you might think, saying, well, Am I in Christ? I don't know. Am I out of Christ today? Am I in Christ tomorrow? You know, and it feels like a wishy-washy thing to you. But no, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you simply said yes to the rescuer, then you are in Christ. And there is no condemnation that should be leveled at you. You should not be experiencing condemnation in your life because you are secure in the love of Christ. And so this condemnation problem, I believe this is the reason why we see so many Christians sick. 
you know, suffering from sickness and disease or, you know, in poverty and they just can't seem to get ahead because of this condemnation. Because the devil has tricked them into thinking that they don't deserve the blessings of God. And it's so untrue. It's so untrue. And so, um, you know, they don't understand that God actually wants them to be well. They look at their performance to see if they qualify. And of course, can we qualify, guys? No, we should know the answer to that by now, right? If you've been following this study. Can we qualify for the blessings of God? No, it never was and never will be about our performance. It's all about what Jesus did for us. And so the devil tries to condemn Christians, believers, who've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, who've been justified and made new creatures in him. He tries to trick them into believing that they're not worthy. And so Christians end up suffering, thinking, well, I don't know if God really would want to heal me or would want to prosper me because, you know, look at all the mistakes I've made and I haven't been a good enough person to earn them or deserve healing. Oh, Jesus. Jesus cleared this up for us. Let's go to Mark 1, 40. Mark 1, 40. So now a leper came to him, a leper came to Jesus, incurable disease, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now let's pause there and think about this man's mindset, right? He might probably saw Jesus working miracles and, you know, that's why he came. Lepers weren't allowed with the general public, the, the population. So he was risking his life to just even make it to Jesus, right? And then he falls down on his knees like in, in submission and servitude and said, Lord, I like, I know you can do this if you want to, if you're willing. And what did Jesus say? Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. So Jesus answered the question, do you want to heal me, Lord? I know you can. Do you want to? And Jesus was moved with compassion and said, yes, I'm willing, be cleansed. And the man was instantly healed. Now, is God a respecter of persons? Do you think this leper, he was more holy than you? Like he had his life together more than you do, and that's why Jesus reached out and said, I'm willing to be cleansed? No, God's not a respecter of persons. And this man wasn't even born again. Jesus hadn't even gone to the cross and paid for that man's sins. Yet he still was moved with compassion and said, yes, I want to heal you. Be cleansed. How much more, guys? You as a child of God who's been rebirthed from above, who's been made righteous by the blood of Jesus, he loves you much more. You've been saved from wrath through him. How much more is he going to say, I'm willing be cleansed, be healed, be made whole. That's already been purchased by the stripes he took on his back before he went to the cross. Not only did he pay the price for your sins, but he paid the price for your healing, your wholeness, your provision, this all-inclusive package. And so how dare we let the devil condemn us and say, no, you're not worthy. You know, no, no, no. Je Jesus doesn't want to heal you because you've been too bad or you haven't, you know, read your Bible enough or prayed enough or done all of these lists and that. Jesus is here saying today, I am willing. Be cleansed. If you need healing in your body right now, I just want you to receive that. Receive his strength in your body right now by his grace because he loves you so much he wants you well he wants you healthy and whole from the top of your head to the soles of your feet that means no defects 
no weakness, no sickness or disease. Don't settle for anything less than the perfect will of God for you. And that is complete health and wholeness. Hallelujah. We are maintained by His grace, church. Not only did we receive salvation by grace, but every step of the way, everything that you need is simply received by His grace. Hallelujah. And so I'm, I'm really, really sensing that there were people watching that, that had something wrong in their body. And again, it's not complicated. God didn't make anything complicated. He wanted every single child, every man, woman on this earth ever to simply receive what they need by grace. And so just receive that healing right now. Don't think, oh, well, I, I need to, I need to, you know, make my list of scriptures and I have to do this and I have to do that. No, 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 no. Pause, pause. Jesus is here right now telling you, I am willing. I want you well. Just receive it. I got you. Just receive it. Amen. Thank God for his goodness. Glory to God. Well, we're going to continue with this next week. We'll pick up right here. We did not get through our whole lesson this week, but it was good. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for the Holy Spirit who knows exactly what you need to hear, right? And so you guys have an awesome week. Be blessed.